the Lucifer letters from the 17th century. Have you heard of them? Well, let me share with you the legend. The legend actually has it that Sister Maria, in 1676, fainted. When she woke up, there were three letters that she says was written by the devil via automatic writing through her. Now, what's interesting is the article that came out a few days ago said that this specific museum that has the letter, it's called the Ludum Science Center in Sicily, they heard via little bird that flew past that they could take that letter and possibly decipher it via software that's available on the dark web. So when you read the articles, there's several articles that say basically the same thing with a few different words, but the same information. You can read about it if you go to the London Times, the uh, Israel Times, etc. And I just want to give you a quick excerpt here real quick from the Times of Israel. Only one of Sister Maria's letters that was composed in 1676 survived. The text has stumped scholars and code breakers for over 300 years. 341 years, actually. Now, researchers from the Ludham Science Center unscrambled the letter using an algorithm found on the dark web. This is a quote from these guys. We heard about the software, which we believe is used by the intelligence services for code breaking. Center director Daniel Abet told the Times of London. We primed the software with ancient Greek, Arabic, uh, Arabic Nanu, Nanu, and runic alphabet and Latin to descramble some of the letter and show it was really devilish. To show that it was really devilish. <laughs> that it really is devilish. Damn it, I need to learn how to read. The scientists concluded that the letters were a jumble of languages composed by Sister Maria herself, saying that she became a skilled linguist during her time at the convent. So the letter describes relationship between humans, God, and Satan. Here's a couple quotes from the letter. God thinks he can free mortals. Sister Maria's letter says, then the letter says, the system works for no one. The text also describes God and Jesus as dead weights. Now, Abete thinks the letter was written by her because she has schizophrenia and that she's also very good at writing multiple languages that she learned in the convent. Now, my question is, wouldn't they have been able to figure that out before if they knew what languages she learned in the convent? And why would it take an algorithm from the dark web to decipher this code if it's written in languages that are already accessible? That makes no sense to me. Now, the letter itself, as you can see, it's right next to me. This is one of the three survived. There's only one letter that survived out of three, according to legend. And, I mean, there's you can read about it at thetimes.co.uk. It's titled, Nun's Letter from Lucifer, Decoded via Dark Web. And the fact that the letter at least according to these guys, says God thinks he can free mortals. This system works for no one. The text also describes God, Jesus, as dead weights. Now, yeah, that's pretty dark. In my opinion, that's very dark. That's anti-Christ, absolutely. That's anti-life and anti-freedom. To say... What do you think if you read a letter that was written by the devil that said, God thinks he can free mortals? Would that make you think that mortals are stuck in a realm and they're not free and God's trying to pull them out and free them? You hear about how the earth is the devil's domain? Well, who is the devil? Who is Lucifer? Who is Satan? Are they one in and of the same? Are they a part of the same family tree? Are they relatives? Seriously. 
Belazub. Who's Belazub? According to uh, ancient text that I read that's thousands of years old, Belazub is different from the devil. Now, Satan, I think, is linked with Saturn because of the name and because a lot of the prophecy and ancient history of Satan, Saturn, a controlling planet, a controlling archetype, one that offers great treasures as long as you stay in the castle, as long as you stay working for Saturn, Satan, you are being offered many prizes and gifts and rewards that I've seen throughout Hollywood, throughout the media, throughout different stories that I've read throughout my life and been told by different people. The question is, has everything been hijacked? What was it like a thousand years ago? What was it like 2,000 years ago? The Gnostic texts have a completely different version and, and vision of who we are, who our creators are, what we're doing here. Yet they have the same players as the New Testament and the Old Testament. How much can we control via mind? How much can we control via thought? The more we learn about our natural abilities, I feel that you need to be much more aware of your thoughts and very careful what you think because you can create those literally in this physical plane very fast once you get to that level. That's why maybe not everybody is given secret knowledge. Like literally learning the Kabbalah. Not the Kabbal, but the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is turning letters into reality. Turning vibrational frequencies into formulas that create matter and create your existence. Or what you experience in your existence, I should say. Create other things into existence. It's incredible. It's like next level stuff. It's, it's like calculus beyond. It's, it's experimental math beyond calculus when you get to that point. So... To get to that point, you have to, I feel, break out of a system that feeds off of you continually offering you little trinkets and treats and, and empires of dirt if you, if you follow the, the orders. Maybe, I mean, yes, you can be granted certain powers and abilities in that, on that side, on that level. Now, I've interviewed people before that do reverse speech. They'll listen to somebody, they'll record them, like a politician as an example, and then they'll play their speech backwards and decipher what that person says. Sometimes what you hear can be debatable, very debatable, and sometimes you can hear something that seems spot on. And whether or not that's your subconscious talking through your conscious, whether or not it's another entity that's found a way to latch on and speak through you, or both, or none. What's your take on that? Because I've heard some very frightening reverse speech analysis where people are talking, you play it in reverse, and it sounds satanic. It sounds dark. It sounds evil. It sounds wicked. And the person that I interviewed felt that that's more of just your, your psychology. That's not an actual deity or entity. I don't know. The archons, these serpent beings, and not good snakes, not the cool snakes, like the cobra, you know, you can, and the cobra's like, snakes have their purpose too. I mean, you know, snakes and rodents. <laughs> so don't get me wrong. I don't think all serpents are bad by any means. There's some really cool snakes out there, but... The serpents talked about via Toth, via Thoth, via Thoth, and the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, I feel are a very good representation of these energies that control people oftentimes without them even knowing it. Especially if you look at the blood sacrifices, the wars, the rituals, the industries that profit off of dark ecstasy, the way that they move, their formulas, etc. It even can break down into angles and formulas and forecasts and predictions and algorithms. I mean, it's fascinating how much, once you understand the Arconic Serpent formula, and then you connect it with industries and peoples and religions and, and archetypes and medias and industries. The formulas and the forecasting is second to none. I, I feel that, well, I don't know about second to none, but it's about as good as it gets in this current matrix that we reside in right now, at least from where I'm at, from my point of view. It's allowed me to really understand broader spectrums, 
very, you know, very far into the future. I've looked so far into the Akashic Records before, so far into the future, and I've seen some of the most frightening things. Like, literally, the hair is standing up on my arms right now. Oh, give me the chills thinking about some of these frightening visions. Now, if I have these visions, if the Akashic Records holds these data packets, this information, that means it is somewhere in the realms of consciousness. So, by creating thoughts, we are creating, we are co-creating life, we are co-creating existence in this dualistic, I don't, what's a good term? A dualistic engine, where this is the engine, duality is the engine that pushes, that drives this system that we're in. Each op, you know, you create something incredible that will, let's say, reverse aging. Then something on the other side does the exact opposite. You have this very dark energy, this very dark invention that destroys time itself, that does the exact opposite and keeps this weird balance and flow in this duality that we seem to reside in right now. Now, let's take a look. I'm going to go ahead and see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you guys. Not really, but zoom in a little bit. So you can see the different characters. And we'll zoom in here. It looks like some of these, these are all sidzils. Each character, each letter is a sidzil, is a symbol, is a spell. But when you get into the sidzils and you start researching these ancient deities that have been around for, I mean, who knows how long, that you write these certain symbols together that create these formulas. It's like calling upon these deities. I wonder how many people have actually done that without even knowing it, like if, if, have summoned up deities via art or writing stuff down, automatic writing, and they didn't realize it consciously at the time. So we'll just kind of look through this for a minute. And then to put into comparison some of these letters, I want to share with you also. And then I'll get back to... So see these letters right here? This is the... This is a magical alphabet. Western mysticism. Esoteric, uh, esoteric knowledge. Nanny, nanny, nanny. You can see that there are some similarities there. If you look at it... We just look at it. Then we'll jump back over here to the letter. Maybe, well, I'll do that next time. Okay, so this is Facebook. This is from Facebook right here. Hold on a second. Okay. So I pulled this up from, I, I changed my camera. So now instead of being on my computer, I've got it up here. So if I'm looking down here, it's because I'm used to looking at the, the camera there. Now I get to look up. This is the Italian Facebook page. So I don't speak Italian. And speaking of Italian, I need to get Mauro Bellino back on the show because this guy has so much knowledge about the original Hebrew transcripts that the Vatican took to create the Holy Bible, the authorized version of the Holy Bible. And what he says about the Elohim, 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 dang it, I can't say that word today, getting a harp on from Alaska. Elohim, there we go, the Elohim, and the Anunnaki are one and of the same, according to Bellino and many others. The manipulators of man, the genetic manipulators. He talks about how how do I put it? He discusses how the way that his formula was put together to describe you know, to, to, to tr his translations, he did a couple of tweaks that make sense 
you really, I really need to get him back on the show and get a really good translator. By making just a couple of tweaks, they were able to manipulate the entire history of mankind. Now imagine being an organization that people believe is directly beneath God. Hundreds of millions of people, billions of people throughout history. And the money and the resources and the organizations and the institutions and the peoples that are connected to that. All being based on control mechanisms, neurolinguistic programming, false realities and pretexts where they would throw in beautiful truths and bits and pieces, but because the underlying theme of the story had false pretexts, it destroyed the whole thing to fit into their formula of control, of Saturn, of Satan, of this, you know, even the rings of Saturn, in my opinion, represent a control, a imprisonment almost, like a, a structure that you're not given freedoms and opportunities to be independent. You have to follow those rules within those parameters, which takes away from your own soul, in essence, and gives to that. It's like everybody that's a part of it, even though they're given great, incredible things, they're still a part of that mafia network. You know, you're still working for Tony, and if you don't work for Tony, what happens? You end up with the fish. Well, just look at Hollywood. Look at the entertainment industry. Look at all these incredible musicians that would do songs and, and write tweets and bizarre cryptic stuff that would foretell their death. It's like, oh, you're, you're not meeting the records. You're not selling enough records. You're not making us enough money. Eh. Well, what happens when we get rid of them? Then people think they're amazing. Then everybody goes out and buys their albums. So, 27. Look up the number 27, the 27 Club. There's a lot of very fascinating connections. Now, does that mean that Saturn is bad? Does that mean that Saturn is evil? Does that mean that, I mean, you be the judge. You come up with your own conclusions. I feel that, there. I mean, even Saturn has its own, there's a reason Saturn is there. There's a reason Satan, the adversary, is there. There's a reason that there's a rodent. There's a reason that there's a snake. There's a reason that there's a sheep. There's a reason that there's a wolf. There's a reason there's a wizard. There's a reason that there's a sorcerer. There's a reason that there is a, uh, a shepherd. This is all connected. These are all different cogs, a part of this ginormous will. And even the Baba Kakra that has the wills of destinies, the wills of karma, the wills of desires, the, the different will, uh, realms, etc. Even the Baba Kakra is just one cog of a much larger cyclical infinite system. Once, you know, some people feel that this is a prison almost. I feel it's a boot camp. I feel that it is a learning process. I feel that maybe for some people it is a prison. I feel that some, for some people it's a, a genuine learning experience to have a good time and, and experience amazing things that they could take with them to future lifetimes and future generations as well as create something here now for those here as well as future generations that will be coming here. What if there are certain entities and archetypes, anti-life, anti, like look at Monsanto. <laughs> In my opinion, that company, that industry, that behemoth that profits billions of dollars off of genetically modifying crops, genetically modifying seeds, coming up with patents that protect plants, from certain stratospheric aerosol injections and high levels of radiation. They're profiting off of the demise of organics. That is anti-organic. Certain industries, especially in this domain that we're in right now, have so much control, make so much money from anti-organic frequencies. If this, even this dense, dark world that we live in, if there's more than 50-50, if you've got 90-10, 90 negative, 10% good, and that 10% can't make up for the other 40% that it needs to provide for because it needs to provide at least 50%. So if that 10% can't make up 50% as a whole, then that 90% will consume the 10% 
then it will consume itself. And then it consumes itself till there's nothing left. And then if you don't have duality, if you don't have an opportunity to create anymore, you have to work within yourself. And it gets to be a finite point, kind of like Toth, Thoth speaks about. Stay out of certain angles. Angles are finite. Circles are forever. Cyclical events. You cannot predict as easily where that person or being or entity or point will be in a circle versus a straight point. So when you have something that becomes so powerful that it eats itself, then, there's, then it, it eats the other side, then it eats itself, then there's nothing left. Then you have nothing. Then you don't have either side. That's why there needs to be balance. That's why we need to come together as a species and say, we will not assimilate to these anti-organic lifestyles anymore. We will not assimilate to the Borg and consume ourselves. We will keep the balance. We will keep control. We will keep a level of faith. We will keep our eyes, ears, minds open. We will not keep them so open that our brains fall out. And we will realize that the mind is like a parachute where it has to be open to work. We have to use discernment. We have to use judgment. We have to use previous experiences that we have had to learn from to make a better decision next time. How often do you have deja vu? Sometimes in my life, I have deja vu beyond deja vu. It's like, whoa, what in the heck? Do you ever wonder what that means? Do you ever think maybe that means you've been there before and you need to make a very crucial decision so you don't go through it again? <clears throat> maybe the reason we keep coming back here is because we made a mistake to where we consumed more than we were supposed to. We went on a downward spiral to the point of where there was nothing left. So we had to shoot ourselves back in the simulation into this time reality matrix, time space chaos system code to rewrite what the mistakes that we made far, far ahead in the timeline so that we can survive. Maybe that's it. And maybe we're doing the same thing we did in this simulation, attempting to fix what happened in the future. And when I read letters like this that describe how this lady, this nun from the 1600s wakes up and, and has these letters that are in cryptic code, and then when they're broken down and deciphered, it talks about you know, anti-God, anti-Jesus, anti-freedom. Um, There's you know, no hope. And we have very little information. The Science Center did not release a whole lot of data on this. The, the Ludum Science Center has only given very little data. But let me share with you. Now let's go to the translation of what their Facebook page says. I started to go on a tangent. I apologize. The devil's letter came to Ludum. The devil's letter is a mis, uh, is, is a written... I don't, know, I don't know if that's mistranslated or not. So it's an incomprehensible characters, or I just can't read, kept in the monastery in... Agrigento, I hope I said that right, I don't speak Italian. A copy is present in the cathedral there. It was the second half of the 16th century when Sister Maria was writing to the confessor when the devil tried to force her to write a dictation or, or to sign the letter directing it directly to ask God for his uncompromising and non-generous mercy towards sinners. To demand that he treat men as devils. Now the venerable understood to write or to subscribe to the letter meant to do her own and above all realized that this meant filling the hell and vanishing the work of our redemption. And although horribly threatened by the devil, wrote on that leaf a single sore bitter ohim, the only word comprehensible between those lines written in demonic characters, still indecipherable today. A prize was awarded a one-month free stay in Agrigento 
to who had provided the translation of the letter. Although, according to many lawmakers, the letter deported with deceit would have no value. We've got a copy. Our cryptography software is working on us. We will let you know. So, I don't know how accurate that translation is, but I get the point. You get the point. And very interesting. Now, once again, you can read about it at the Times of Israel, 17th century nun's letter from the devil finally decoded. And then here is the alphabet. And then also, this makes me think about the devil's Bible, the Codex Gigas, that was supposedly written overnight. This humongous, the largest medieval Bible ever constructed. And they verified it was from one hand. It was from one monk. The recluse, he calls himself. Why is it called the Devil's Bible? Well, they say it's because of the drawing of the devil. But does that actually make it the Devil's Bible? And was that done via automatic writing? Did the devil do that through him? Or is that just a tell? Is that something that he could have spent weeks, months, years on? And because we weren't there, we don't know. The monastery wanted to look good. They wanted to freak people out. They said, oh, it was just one night. The devil did it. And then people are like, wow, if the devil could write that in one night through me, geez, like imagine the things I could do. I could become a Hollywood director. I could write movies and storylines and become rich and fascinating overnight. All I'd have to do is worship the devil. And it makes me think of that song, Empires of Dirt, by Kurt Cobain. Not Kurt Cobain. Trent Reznor. <laughs> Trent Reznor was calling up Kurt in the afterlife saying, Kurt, what should I write about? And Kurt said, Empires of Dirt. Now, some people said that it wasn't Trent that wrote Empires of Dirt. It was um, Johnny Cash. It was Trent Reznor. Empires of Dirt. You could have it all. My Empires of Dirt. I will let you down. I will make you hurt. Now, I used to think that he was talking specifically about selling his soul to the devil. But after listening to that song multiple times, I think that he was referring to heroin and what happens if you get addicted to heroin. And maybe he was also incorporating selling his soul as well into that. I've heard a lot of Trent's songs, and I think Trent is genius. The guy is brilliant. He's one of the most amazing songwriters and artists in our time, of any time. The guy's genius. But he, I've heard him sing many songs of the past talking about selling his soul. He doesn't have a soul anymore to sell. And then one of his more recent albums, not his most recent, one of his more recent albums. Actually, I, now that I look back at it, it's probably 10 years old almost. Uh, there's a song called Capital G, talking about the, the world stage that we have today. And then there's a song called Some Zero, I think, where he talks about how shame on us, doomed from the start, all we are are zeros and ones. Have mercy on our very little hearts. Some people might be just zeros and ones. Some people might just be code. I feel that I have a soul. I hope I have a soul. I, I hope you have a soul, and I hope our souls are infinite. I hope our souls are divine. And, I mean, for everybody's sake, I hope that they have a soul. Yet, when you see people do certain things, or at least when the media shows you certain things that were done by people, and when I read through some of these comments, I wonder sometimes, you know, if you don't have a conscience, do you have a soul? You just missed that part in your, in your creation of your physical... Your, that part was just left out when your physical body was created? I don't know. And, you know, I mean, for example... Um, here we go. Formula 13. This stuff is amazing. I love this stuff. This packaging. It's... I mean, I don't know what the packaging itself is made out of, but the, uh, the product is... Made of orga oh, marshmallows, organic marshmallow, organic blessed thistle, organic green tea, organic white tea, organic malva, organic stevia, organic aloe, organic ginger, papaya enzymes. Got a bunch of good stuff in here. Well, those fruits, when they were alive... Did they have a consciousness? Did they have a type of soul? I mean, a type of energy? They've done plenty of experiments on plants that the way you talk to plants and are, act around plants, they react to that. So 
maybe everything has a part of a soul, but maybe us as humans have something even even more amazing than just a soul archetype, like a spirit, a divine spark that is even above the soul, that works through the soul. Mind, body, soul, the connections. How far up does it go? Well, I'll tell you this much. This letter right here is it's pretty spooky. I think it's pretty spooky because could you imagine if there are entities and archetypes that literally their sole purpose is to m turn you into something evil or something decayed or to something that stays low and suppressed and imprisoned? Like the Holy Spirit, I firmly believe, I don't know what the Holy Spirit is, but I firmly believe in the Holy Spirit. I mean, I felt it, and my whole body feels electric when I do. Like, my, my neck will tingle. My arms tingle. My body tingles. The hair stands up on my arms. Hair stands up on places I didn't even know I had hair. That's incredible. That, I feel, is the Holy Spirit working divinely through me. Now, doesn't mean I know what that is. I just feel that it's real. So when I read stuff like this, I find it very eerie. And this validates to me that there are absolutely two sides. And we need to be careful which side we choose because we may be there for a long time. And it makes me also think about the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, Thoth, Thought, discussing how even at the next level, you still need to be aware. You still need to be constantly on the move and prepared because you can make a mistake at the next level. It's not like everything's going to be perfect there. And the next level, and the next level. We constantly are working and moving and, and moving and being fluid and expanding our minds, our consciousness, our spirit essence, our soul. The body that we're in right now, this incredible software packet that we've been given that is a physical body as well, this is important too, folks. We got to realize that, yes, there is a carrot at the end of the stick. Sometimes we need to enjoy where we are now. Sometimes we need to realize this is still connected to the future. The future is connected to the past. So when we leave, when we go to the next level, this is still very valid right here. Time is infinite. Time is, time is theory. Time is perception. Maybe 50 million years from now, you might want to come back and experience this again because you've experienced so many other things. And with that said, I, you know, be excellent to each other. Be awesome and amazing to each other. And support our sponsors, GetTheT.com. I love this stuff. I've been taking this stuff called GI Joy. Wow, this stuff is incredible. It's got organic colostrum in it, aloe, turmeric, probiotics. What else does it have in it? Peppermint. I take two tablets a day. This is a two-month supply. It cost me like $37 and some change. And what I like about it is it gives me good energy, clarity, and thought. It helps my food digest better, and I just feel awesome. So I would definitely check it out. It's called GI Joy, and it's cheap when you consider how much you get for 37 bucks. Like a two-month supply? How cool is that? Anyway, there you go. Get the tea.com. Check it out. You'll thank me later. Be the change you want to see. Nanny, 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 nanny.